But it all has to be said. It all has to be said. I remember my teacher died. His wife beat me up. <laughs> and you call yourself a shaman. Bam, bam. The guy's 97 years old. You couldn't save him. You call yourself a shaman. But he's old. Bam, bam, bam. I hate your guts. You bad. We'll tell you everything we know. Bam, what? It's wailing on me. What did I do? I sat like there like a cat taking a crap, you know. Just... <laughs> Just squinting, taking it, you know. Whomp, whomp. Because I love that old woman. I still love her. She's still alive. I love the old woman. I know what she felt like. She loved the old man. She hated me for not being able to save him. And I hate myself for not being able to save him. On the other hand, he's happy right now watching me go through this. So you got to do it. And he rides me like a guy on a horse. My mother-in-law said once, so I don't know what happened to you. You act like him. You look like him. You smell like him. You dress like him. You, every, what's going on? You just like him. We couldn't get rid of him. He's still here. And I'm still here too. So the grief, you see how it is? That's how it is. That's how it is. And so the idea is, is that people need each other to have that possibility so that they have the courage to be down. And the courage to be up and the courage to have that strange mixture called life. Because to us, heaven isn't some place we go to, it's some place we recognize. And it ain't a good place, it's a delicious place, a wonderful place, a strange place, a mysterious place. It's called sitting around the fire with all your people alive and maybe sick, maybe well, together, smoking the cigar, eating the food, having enough firewood having enough clothes on your back, telling jokes, having enough people left to slap out the tortilla and talk about what so-and-so did or, or this dog runs through or the time when you cooked the crabs, they all jumped out of the pot and ran away. And you know, all of these crazy things that happened to her about the guy that slept in a coffin I used to tell you about, you know, and, and all that. Yeah, well, that's heaven to us. And to me, to me, that's it. To heaven is being with you guys. Like we got one person there who's grumpy, doesn't like me. So that guy looked like a fake and a fraud to me. And I said, I like this person too. I like skeptics, you know, because it's a challenge to win them over. And I like the person that loved me because it's a challenge to meet the adequacy of that love. I said, all the different shaped buckets to fill. And I've got a lot of things I can give and a lot of place for you to put your gift to. So grief and praise comes down to be able to receive gift and be able to give gift. Because receiving gift good is the way a poor person gives a rich gift. They know how eloquent how to receive the gift properly. I remember my old teacher, he said to me, he says, he bust into my house one night, and he's like that, kicked me out of bed, he says, get up, drag me up by my neck, pull me to my feet. At first I thought he was an intruder, and then I realized my teacher. He said, what do you mean by not taking payment for your work? I said, these people are poor. They have nothing. I don't need it, money. I've got money. I sell paintings. I make money selling paintings. I don't need to charge them for for doctoring them. It's terrible. I mean, they have nothing. I can't take stuff from them. He says, what kind of idiot are you anyway? You disgrace them. They come to give you something, they think they got something to give you, and then you act like it's nothing good enough for you. I say, yeah, but I still I can't take from them. No, it doesn't work like that. They give to you, and then you distribute to those that don't have anything. Oh. Oh, I see. You're dishonoring my people and everything I taught you. You have to praise what I taught you by receiving the gift. So the praise has to be an ability to receive properly, to give well, to grieve well, and to receive grief well, which is a really, really hard one. To sit there like the cat taking a crown. <laughs> Not to take abuse, but to understand the reception of grief as a legitimate form of expression that doesn't need Valium to cure. You don't need to medicate. I mean, nine tenths of what they're calling. I, I was on the. T I, I know, I'm going to let some out of the bag now. Don't tell anybody. I told you this, but it's being recorded, so it's, it's screwed up. But I went on the TV first time in my life in England in a debate. I had to take the challenge. It was six psychiatrists. I don't like one. I like six English psychiatrists. And it's a two-hour debate, 800,000 viewers on mental illness. It's me and this guy from India. 
And the guy from India was actually going along with them guys till I got up there and said, yeah, I'm with you, man. You know? <laughs> actually, didn't say it like that, but he was very beautiful, named Sashi. And so all these guys were talking about, because there, there was a report on the World Health Organization, who uh, used to be a big enemy of mine, actually. And they said that there was a rise in the instance of mental illness. And that if it continued at the present rate, it would be epidemic. And I said, what do you mean, will be? <laughs> it's epidemic because humans are mentally ill by nature. <laughs> by their definition. By my definition, they're fine. Okay. What I meant by that is it's true what they're saying. I understand what they're saying, but there's two things about that. One is just that they're counting depression as a mental illness. And that's because the people don't know how to grieve. So you take, for instance, people who are from tribal cultures or even village cultures like in uh, Afro-Caribbean, like the, in uh, Haiti or, or uh, Trinidad or Tobago or anywhere that's got their own style doing things. And you put them in a big city like London or New York or maybe here, I don't know. And right away the children start getting crazy. And then they start getting in gangs and they start fighting because the parents all of a sudden have to be straight and they can't grieve and they can't get in the street and play their drum, sing their song when somebody died. They can't do it. They all of a sudden get to be showing up for work just on time and drive the, drive the bus, go home, beat their kids up for all the attention that they felt in the street. Kid become like that, goes out in the street, doesn't know what this grief is of his father, starts knocking up the neighborhood guys. You know how it goes. Same story everywhere. All right? But back home, what's happening? Somebody died, 500 people. They're all making this big wake. And there's all these chickens being slaughtered. And all this drink is going down and all these marimbas are playing and everyone's praising the dead man, dancing and all this energy is going for grief. In the instance of grief. You take that away from the people, you're going to have violence. So definitely going to be a rise in depression. And it's going to be like lemmings going over a, a cliff until people learn how. That's just going to happen. Anyway, I won the debate. And uh, <laughs> hands down, the taxi drivers everywhere I went, I said, I'm with you, mate. That's exactly what it's like. That's what I said to me, my, my dear old mom. That's what she, she used to know how to cry. You know, we had a lot of goats, and then the guys would go on and on and on. And the Irish, they still do it to some extent. You know, where they have their wakes. Different peoples all over the world. They have a wonderful way. But it's not just death. There's grief is in everything. So when you, when, when you have the ceremony and you're making a ritual, when you're praying, the word in Maya for song and the word for weeping is the same word. They call them weepers or singers. And shamans, the, the slang term for a, a shaman is a weeper or a singer. You knows how to sing the prayers. So you got to make that sound that draws into your heart. You know, I know how to do it good. I can do it much worse. Bring every, even the dogs will weep. They'll howl. Even the trees will weep. Everything will weep. We praise everything. It has to weep. The stone has to weep. The rainbow has to weep. The sky has to weep. The otter has to weep. The dog has to weep. The house has to weep. The people have to weep. Our ancestors will weep. Everything will weep. We'll make everything weep. And that's not grandiosity. That's praise of life. So if you don't praise, you're killing life. And if you don't praise the youth, you're killing the youth. And if you don't teach them how to grieve, you're killing your grandkids. Because it's going to jump down. It's going to jump down. And it's not your fault. It's just the way it is. And this culture is the way it's come around these days. Because it's all about being able to measure something. And you cannot measure grief. And you can't sell it. You can sell medication and solutions. But there is no solution to grief. And the solution to life is just what is. It has to happen. It's a natural thing. Wonderful thing. And praise has to happen too. You have to learn it. It has to be taught. You have to raise the people's love. You know? It's like me. I won't fight anybody that doesn't hate me properly. <laughs> if their hate is low class, I can't fight them. <laughs> if I take their head, who can I show it to? There's no honor in that. But if they hate me properly, we're probably best friends. And we'll probably be together in the same battle to help people live. We will employ that wonderful marvelousness. 
And the heroic effort of the youth, some youth, maybe like this lady right here, Erin. One day I remember a while back, she's going up there and she's going to fight the whole world about some issue. Of course. We're not going to say, like I heard one time in the conference, there was a young man. There's a lot like yourself. He was, you know, a little older than you, but same idea. He got up and he had this whole plan for eradicating, getting rid of racism and all kinds of problems. Everything in the world, he had all figured out how to do it. And people were yelling, and said, ah, sit down, shut up. I said, hey, I stood by him and I pulled my knife and I said, you have to come through me to stop this man's idealism. Because you kill that idealism, you slit in your own throat and your children's throat. Oh, he's not going to do it, but he's going to do something. And whatever it is, I want to beat her when he does it. And who knows, he might got it figured out. What do I know? I'm just an old lame shaman. I don't know. Maybe he does. But I'm not going to put him down and I'm not going to let you. But anybody that won't stand up for it is letting them kill him. You can't let them kill him. And that's grief too. It's like me now, if your tears in my eyes for all the things that have gone down, nobody would stand up for. Huh. How many of you are, are old hippies, you know, from the 60s? You thought things would be different by now. Maybe 100%, except for the youth. Oh, 60s guys, well, I didn't, I was no hippie, you know. I grew up in the reservation. We thought they were great because they always gave you a ride. <laughs> Their food wasn't too good, but they always offer you some. That's the honest to God truth. You could always have a place to sleep, and they always give you a ride, and they give you that food with lots of garlic in it. I don't know, but they were nice to us. They were nice to us. They were hoping for another, another kind thing going on. But they were children. Now they were not children anymore. And that's why it's still looking, people still looking. They still got that good, good thing in sight. Still looking. So that spirit has got something that goes beyond us. And you've got to have a vision of that, I think. I'm not ordering. I'm in the church, so I'm starting to get preachy here. But well, it's fun, you know, I get to pulp it. I was going to stand up there, but, you know, I might start a cult or something. You know. I don't want to do that. It's be fun, you know. And... Uh, the spirit is big. The spirit is really, really big. And that's why you can't let loneliness kill everything. Because it's loneliness is at the base of all this fear of being alive. And it is grief. And that's because the people not together, they feel alone. So don't be alone. It's a hard thing to do. This way things are. And there's times to be alone. But you have to know there's a place to go back to that where you're not alone. Definitely time when you gotta be alone. I mean, you gotta go out in the bush or you gotta go off here, think this out, or just be with nature, which is another form of not being alone. Because you're never alone out in the woods. Woods, man, surrounded with life. I mean, I feel happy out in the bush. Love be out in the bush. You guys know me, know that's true. Try to call me on the telephone, forget it. I'm, if I'm at home, I'm not at home. But it's a community of trees, community of bird, community of stone, community of water. We know the spirits live in those things. We feed them everywhere we go. It's really hard to go around with me. Any of you know this? You got to stop at Mississippi River, get out of the car, give a gift to the water. Somebody died, I got to weep in the water. Every time I cross a body of water, I got to give a gift. Every time I make a fire, I make a gift. Every time I eat, I make a gift. Everything I do is a gift. So like it's coming down it's to gratitude. Grief is a form of gratitude for being alive. Because if you didn't miss it, then you weren't here. And if you don't cry for it, it no longer has any position in life. And for it to take its new position in life, to let it go, as they say in this culture, we don't say that. We say we, it becomes a deep water fish, we say. It's like the dead person, you know, it's like a human being form like this. And then once it goes 400 days, we call it becomes a deep water fish. It's now transformed into other being. <laughs> it has a wind in its scales, yeah, you know. We make a lot of things. We say, we're going to send a dead person across the ocean to the other side, to the spirit world. We say, I send you with canoes made of tears and oars made of our old songs. Please receive them on the beach of stars, the liver of the universe on the other side, all you old people. So all the ancestors waiting for this poor thing to come over there and they drag them out of the boat. And they say, well, don't look back. They say, don't look back. You don't see anything. That's what will scare you. 
because you won't see anything. Whereas the people on this side that are still alive, weeping tears, doing their dance, doing their songs, and putting all the gifts in and making big old feasts every uh, 13, 20 days, 13, 20 days, feeding this person on the other side so that they can get initiated. They can't get initiated unless they've got enough people weeping for them. It's like the young men and young women when they leave home to get initiated. What are their mothers and fathers doing? Weeping at the house. They're not sitting there saying, oh, thank God we got that kid out of the house. They're not saying that. They're saying, I miss this child. There's a huge hole in our house. These chiefs are awful people, they say. I used to wonder why they carried those big sticks. And then I found out, it's just the women are always attacking us for taking their kids away. Honest to God. We have to hold them back. I always wonder why they picked, you know, strong, able-bodied, you know, 30-year-old men with these big sticks to initiate a bunch of young guys. It wasn't for the guys. It was for their moms. <laughs> Keep them back so they won't crack you over the head with a rock. They do. You think I'm kidding? I mean, there's women. Oh, I'm telling you. They lose all control, and we love that because when the kid sees that mother going into a huge rage, over the loss of this child leaving home. And she's only going half a mile down the road <laughs> to an initiation chamber where it's perfectly as safe as it is at their house, which is not safe, but it's what it is. But they have to cry. So when the kid sees that and all his chums see that or all her chums see that or they all see everybody else's moms doing that too and all their dads doing that, you know, they get that look like you do with your dad. He's like, mm, hey, man, they miss me. <laughs> And their parents missed them. We are missed. And when we're not missed, what happens to us? We die. And that's what happens with the spirits when we don't miss them. And that's what happens when our relatives and our friends when we don't miss them. That's what happens to life when we don't miss it. And when we miss it, we grieve. And when we grieve, it feeds it. And when it feeds it, it makes something else come alive and it doesn't end. And then we are seen as worthy and so we get weeped after when we leave. And then when we get to be a fresh, deep water fish, we can blow some wind back in the sails of the people here and to the animals here and the plants here and the ecosystems here. We can breathe it back in again. So that's what that's about there. Beat it all to death, I guess. Said a lot of words. Any questions? <laughs> I always like to see the answer. In the village, they never have this question, period. But here I was, I would just harangue everybody till they're destroyed. And then they get their chance later. And we have to sit and listen to them. Yeah? No questions? You have a question? If our relatives or people who live before us do yeah. not have a chance to grieve, mm -hmm. then what is their spirit like now? Um, what are they able to do? Well, if they weren't able to grieve, it means that somebody behind them didn't get grieved. Right? Let's say a grandma couldn't weep, and grandpa couldn't weep, and your mom and dad couldn't weep. So that means your great-grandma and great-grandpa didn't get wept for properly. So they become ghosts. And they get hanging on your grandma and your grandpa. And your grandma and grandpa, that's why they can't grieve. And then that jumps down to your mom and dad. And then you're the lucky one, you get to carry it. And then you're carrying it and you're trying to be as macho as you can to hold all this weight and eventually start popping joints and kinds of things. Look at myself, same. And so what there is there is it has to do rituals that, that capture this ghost and then divide it down into its parts. Divide it down into its parts. Divide it down into its original components. Original components. And send it back one at a time. Each piece, each generation. I can't, you have to have mock funerals. For each generation, they didn't get, gra didn't get grieving. And then you gotta take lessons in grieving. You gotta learn how, it's a skill. 
Different cultures have different ways of doing it. I mean, like even poet in this culture, like I look to Robert Bly or, or uh, William Stafford or, uh, or this guy Nolan or uh, what's his name, Louis Jenkins, or any of these characters around here. And the women, there's a lot of women poets especially. You know, some of them probably don't even know, some of these people, like Myra Shapiro and all that. They, they weep in these poems. This is like just big teardrops, that's all it is. This is big teardrops. And then when it hits you, what happened? You're inspired to write a poem, or pull your hair out, or weep, or some kind of grief. But you don't want to internalize it. You want to make it into a community feast. And make a lot of trouble out there. Because that's, uh, that's what it's all about. Because you have to have the, the people together, all together, all together. And then they can watch you to make sure nothing happens. For instance, if you have deep, deep thing and you can't go, you can't go, you can't go, you can't go. And you feel it, mm, making all kind of trouble in there. You've got gastroenteritis and, you know, and a hiatal hernia and all that stuff, you know, that everybody gets from it, you know. And, and even intestinal ulcers and so forth. And then what happens then is, is we've always prescribed for someone to get two people on either a side of you or four. And you go to beach where the water is because the water takes all the sadness. And you have to stand in that water and weep. If you can't do that, then there's things called tequila. And you drink one whole bottle as quick as possible without throwing up. And if that don't do it, you get another one. And you keep going until you're miserable. This is a poison. Because the grief is going to kill you. So you have to take something that's going to kill you to stop you from dying. And you get to vomit out that poison. And you get to weep out that poison. You have to say lots of things you don't mean. Because I know in this Scandinavian culture, basically, that we have here, Nordic cultures, Germans and Finns and Norwegians and Swedes and Danes and even Irish in a way, they're, they're not, they, they have to, um, you know, they, they try to say what they mean. Mayans are never impressed with meaning. They're impressed totally with style. <laughs> they do love content. They love content. But the way you say things makes a lot of difference. And the way you act makes a lot of difference to the spirits because they're drinking everything you do. And if you're doing everything like this, the spirits are bored and they're dying. And so they're going to come take it out of your hide and they make accidents and problems and all kinds of things. So when you go down to that beach, you have two designated driver or designated like, like medicine people and they stay sober and they stay detached. But they keep you from dying, they keep you from drowning, they keep you from hurting yourself, but you can flail, you can weep, you can cry, you can moan, you can punch, you can say anything you gotta say, and they drag you back, and they won't let you sleep. And they push you out again and make you do it again. Losing control, necessary. You have to lose total control. But you will never do that on your own, because it's not safe. You have to do that with friends. And you know, all the people here say, yeah, but I might not ever come back. Bullshit. You'll be back at the job on Monday, man. <laughs> and you'll be very much better at your job. Or maybe you won't. But then you won't care. <laughs> because you're going to become a poet or something. Because you got the grief out of your gut and you're not trying to impress anybody with that bullshit anymore. All right? So, so the point is, is that out of control for attention, no good. No good. That's uninitiated behavior. Out of control for its own sake, no good. Uninitiated behavior. Weeping and having to say what has to be said, yeah. We don't want to resolve it. We don't care about the content. It's irrelevant to us. What is relevant to us is the fact that your beauty is enraged by having a loss. And that you beautifully express this in a way that is magnificent and deep from your soul. And that there are people around to keep you from dying while you do it. And when that happens, then you're sick. Because you have been living with a huge chunk of yourself in grief and thinking it was an organ in your belly. And then what do you do with that big hollow spot? Well, don't go fill it up with more booze. And don't fill it up with cheese. And don't fill it up with TVs and movies. Don't try to fill it up. You can't fill it. You just gotta wait. There's a spirit that's gonna fill it up. And what is it gonna fill it up with? And fill it up with beauty and it's gonna fill it up with your own soul because your own soul can't live because there was no damn place for it because you have all ancestral grief sitting in your belly for, for hundreds of years of peoples. So once it gets thrown out, it's this big vacancy. 
and you don't even know how to walk, you're even imbalanced. Because you're, you're, all this weight is missing. And you get scared. You feel like you can't fly. That's why you have to have people with you. Keep you, you know, from wobbling too much and to go through this molting period. Like a little frog or a little hawk lose all its feather, got to grow a new feather. It has to have two weeks to do that. Two months, whatever it takes. And then when you come back alive, this new thing starts growing in there. Whoa, man, what's this? And don't worry, there'll be more grief. It never goes away. There's always plenty more. Yeah, I met a guy in a men's conference once. He said, well, Martin, I don't want to go through this um, grief ritual. And I said, why don't you? Well, I kind of like my grief. I don't want to get rid of it. And I said, well, you're going to have more. Don't worry. <laughs> Once you get rid of this, you can get a new brand. You know? <laughs> I said, don't worry about a thing. We love you, man. Go in there. We're not going to let you die. You get rid of your grief. There's still a person left over afterwards, you know? And they weren't sure about that, you know? So, you know, that's, that's one of the things. So the idea is to, is, to, is to go there and come back alive. And it takes people to help you with that. It takes a village. And whatever motley look your village has, it's your village. No, it's your village. Don't throw them away. Don't throw them away. This is this, this precious, man. It's precious to friends. Precious to relatives. It's precious. No matter how odd or weird they are, it's precious. Because this, this darkness is deep, as they say. And we're walking with those canes. We don't have no food, no spirit food. And what little we got, we got to share. And a little bit goes a long ways when you share. And we don't share, you're going to die from starvation, from keeping it all inside. Because when you grieve, you're feeding something. When you give this away, you're feeding something in the spirit. That's why we like to do it at the ocean, because the ocean likes to take all the pain out of the body. Then when you're done doing that practice, that's it. You get sick. The people watch over you for a couple of days, and we drink these herbal remedies to take all that junk out of your system. The sadness actually become material. It passes out of your body. I don't want to describe it to you, because it's awful. And then you go up to hot springs, and you sit in those hot springs two, three days off and on. You drink the water cooked with the plants. And then you just sleep for like four or five days. Then they bring you back home and they have a big feast. Everybody's waiting. And they sing a song and then they praise life. And they praise everything. And they praise each person. They praise the little one. They praise the old one. They praise the one that went. Uh, everything they can think of. It's essentially shamans are praisers. They big roll calls of things to praise. And they show up for the feast and we give them all the gifts. And they eat that instead of us. And then together we work. Them on this side, me on that side. Rhythm. Very necessary.